to better understand our world, ourselves, and our future. This program is made possible by the people of Chevron. Chevron, giving thought to television. place unscathed by the claw and crush of civilization. A world untamed, wondrous, and free. This is Alaska. Winter temperatures skid to numbers so low they are barely comprehensible, and yet a few staunch pioneers call this place home. Accept the hardships of Alaska, they have sought them out. Their experience tantalizes the imagination and challenges the spirit. Theirs is the story of Breathing Alaska. history of this planet, human beings have settled in groups for companionship, convenience, and safety. As pioneers swept westward across America, they settled nearly all the open spaces. But there is a place, even today, where human beings are rare. In Alaska, the population of the entire state is about the same as many cities elsewhere. And deep in the North Woods, beyond mountains and rivers that have no name, there is virtually no one. The largest of the United States, Alaska sprawls across 591,000 square miles. 99% of this immensity, untouched by pressure or progress, remains uninhabited and wild. But a sprinkling of people have chosen to move here and live off the land. Widely scattered and far from roads, stores, or medical care, they must rely almost solely on their own efforts to stay alive. A primary link with the outside is bush pilot Roger Dowding. I've done many different types of flying, and this is what really keeps my interest. This is the most challenging for me, the most rewarding. I'm just in awe of all this beauty, of all this wonder up here. It's just miles and miles and miles. You can fly for hours and hours and hours and just never see any sign of any human being. And there's just no other place in the world you could go and, and do this. No place. 
Now living more than a hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle, Haimo Korth was fed up with city life. Even as a teenager, he yearned for a quieter, simpler existence. I couldn't hack the city, I just, uh, the towns. I mean, walking on pavement it hurts my feet. I mean, I could walk on rocks all day out here, but I, I couldn't walk on pavement. That's, uh, that's too much, you know. And I couldn't handle the, the masses of people that many. I like people, but I don't like masses. <laughs> With their two small daughters, the Korths live almost entirely off the land. 19, when he arrived from Wisconsin, Haimo braved the bush alone for six years, then married Edna, an Alaskan Eskimo. You make me not here. The family has never had a water bill, never owned a light bulb. The Korths are among the most isolated human beings in all of North America. The bush plane represents mail, supplies, and their only human contact for most of the year. But these aircraft are not always safe or reliable. And almost daily, bush pilots are redefining the word runway, finding out just how small and how rough one can be. How many, how about west of here? Lots? West of here. There was lots, lots crossing on the upper Shane Jack a week ago. Usually the first question a bush pilot hears is about the movement of game. Haimo is looking for caribou. Not, not big wads of them, but there's quite a few scattered out. But there's no big, I haven't seen any big, big groups. It is early fall. In the weeks ahead, Haimo must lay in a supply of caribou meat to see the family through the winter. Without hunting, humans could not survive here. This far north, poor soil and short summers make farming almost impossible. Close to home, Edna and the children gather what little they can. In summer, the tundra supports a few wild fruits, like blueberries and cranberries. Outdoors, Edna always wears a revolver. Bells help keep track of wandering children and may scare off wolves and bears. The courts get about 80% of their food from the land, but they must spend about $1,500 a year on supplies like ammunition, flour, salt, powdered milk. Haimo and Edna, both licensed hunters, may each take 10 caribou a year. I look at this as a food source, there's nothing else, it's just a, a food source. It's not a, a pleasure hunt, I mean, it's... It's like going to the grocery store, but in a different way. And since the nearest grocery store is 200 miles away, this is your grocery. We'll use the skin for, for our bedding and for our winter clothes, we use the skin for socks and for parkas. And we eat almost everything from it. 
anything that's left in the ground here, which is a very little. The wolves will eat it up, or the ravens and the fox and the wolverine or a grizzly bear might come around and eat it up. So nothing is wasted out here, nothing. I mean, this, this land, it's too rough of a country for uh, an animal or a person to waste anything out here. Yeah. Precious cargo, the meat must now be protected from marauding animals. Only the night before, a grizzly came within feet of the cabin and used a tree as a scratching post. A common type of storage is known as a cache, from the French word for hiding place. In summer, a hole dug in the permafrost acts as a natural refrigerator. Now get on then, just like you do. Get on. Get on, real quick, get on. Some settlers are loners, but for Haimo, companionship is vital. I think prolonged isolation out here, I did it six years by myself, and that <laughs> is no good. <laughs> no good for anybody. And right now, if something happened, to Edna that I was alone again, I wouldn't live out here alone. That's that's too crazy, because you do become nuts. I mean, you can't help it. It just, when I mean, you start talking to yourself and everything like that. And good evening. Today is Monday, July 30th. This Mail arrives by plane only three or four times a year. But every night, Bush families devour outside news on trapline chatter. They cannot call out, only listen. But for this brief time across broad stretches of desolate wilderness, human lives touch as if they were next door neighbors. We are all fine here. Richard will be leaving for Hawaii in a few days. To Diane on the Chattanooga coming from Derrick and North Pole. We're back from Valdez. Done good fishing. I'll be coming in tomorrow about noon. Love you very much, Derrick. <laughs> As the air chills and the days shorten, there is a heightened urgency to prepare for winter. All life exalts in the pageant that is autumn. south of the Korths is another cabin home. Like most, it's located on a river for water, transport, and a ready supply of fish. With winter approaching, fish wheels operate non-stop. These clever contraptions may harvest several hundred pounds of salmon a day which will be smoked or dried, and as temperatures drop, frozen. Errol Wilson moved to Alaska after a brush with the law. He straightened out his life, fell in love with the wilderness, and has never left. Rebecca Wilson's garden would not be possible further north. But here, fertile soil and warm summer months provide prime growing conditions. 
my father loved nature and I think he was the one that got me interested in the outdoors and he used to take us backpacking up in the Sierras and my mother she's more of a town person she likes to go to the theater and read but uh, my dad was the one that really got me into the outdoors the river is the Wilson's link to the outside world laboriously hauling supplies upstream Errol has brought in something one hardly expects 80 miles from the nearest road. The Wilsons, in local slang, have gone mechanical. Just because you live in the bush, you don't have to be a barbarian. You like the comfortable things. Even though you like the isolation and the quiet, you still like to be comfortable. And I think that's why we just like all the little gadgets and are always fixing things and inventing things just to make life a little bit easier. A metal drum that floated into their lives one day has become a priceless reservoir collecting rainwater runoff from the roof, which in turn is gravity fed indoors. But this is just the beginning in this cabin of surprises. bring a piano in, which is going to be a real feat in itself, getting a piano up the creek and lining it in the canoe. And then Errol wants to build a new addition onto the cabin here so he can have a pool room. And he's going to teach me how to play pool. <laughs> so when we have company, they can go in and play pool, and I'll play the piano and keep them occupied. Close by, at least as the crow flies, live one of the few remaining bush families the Wilsons know. But 40 miles of wilderness travel would be so arduous and time consuming that Randy and Karen Brown might as well be a continent away. Tell me if it's straight, is it straight? As a child, okay. Karen Callan Brown longed for a cabin in the woods, as far from New Jersey's urban sprawl as she could get. In 1981, she and Randy Brown built that cabin log by log on their honeymoon. Their son Gabriel is three, Jed is seven. Neither has ever lived in a city. Before winter closes in, Randy must stockpile meat. In this part of Alaska, the principal large game is moose. Randy imitates rutting males to attract their attention. I've often said, uh, give me a canoe and open water and I'm happy. And it's true. Uh, one of the reasons I'm out here, which is that not everything is owned. You don't have to buy everything. It doesn't all belong to somebody else. You have wide open spaces, you have wood for your fires, you have the, the meat, the complete food. You don't have to go out and buy anything. The scent of a fresh kill might attract bears, so Randy reloads immediately.
first time I shot a moose was a, must have been 18 years old, and uh, I felt it was the first real thing that I did, putting in uh, several months of food for myself and uh, quite a bit of food for the dogs as well. There's not a whole lot of plants to eat. There's berries, and, and there's a few plants in season. The native people that used to live up here, they lived primarily on meat and fat, and the two go together. Bush life is not only rigorous, but exact. Randy timed the hunt for when moose are fattest, and dropping temperatures will keep the meat from spoiling. Although the browns together consume about five gallons of animal fat a year, they don't worry about cholesterol. Randy, who tests reasonably low, feels the extreme temperatures and heavy work burn the fat off. A wide variety of reasons why people come out here, and some people are coming out because they've had bad experiences elsewhere and they're coming out to escape those things that they see in society that they can't change and don't want to deal with. I don't come out here to escape myself. I come out because it's exciting. There's no doubt about it that that gets my blood running, you know, going through a, a nice rapid or climbing a mountain and seeing a nice view or getting a nice piece of meat. And I'm out here by choice. I'm out here because I want to be. And uh, when I leave, it'll be because I want to do something different. It won't be because I have to run from it. Winter is the most crucial fact of life in Alaska. It gives new meaning to the word extreme. Nature has equipped the wildlife to deal with winter's savagery. Human beings are not so fortunate. The record temperature is 83 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. 60 below is not uncommon. Challenged at every turn, Edna Korth, like all wives and mothers here, devotes exhausting hours to food, clothing, and looking after the children. No one has what is known elsewhere as leisure time. It has been said, the true Alaskan is someone who has experienced several seasons of cold, snow, and darkness, kept a hold on their nerves, and survived. Haimo Korth has been here for 16 winters. Frostbite to us is like sunburn to some people down there. I mean, unless it's extreme frostbite where, you know, your foot is completely frozen and stuff like that, you know. But uh, frostbite on the cheeks and on the nose, it's I mean, get, like every other week I got that. It's just nothing. And I've frozen my heel and my left foot, and it's a common thing. Haimo has set snares by hacking through the three-foot-thick ice that blankets the river. Trapping beaver is work, work, and work, and nothing but work. One of the first things you, you got to do is go there in fall time, find out where they're building their houses, putting their feed piles, find out where the runways are, the, the deepest holes, so you can put out your beaver sets there. Some years when I have a lot of beaver, then I, then I mark them out a, on a map so I know where to go. And then... Uh, Come, come winter time, like this late winter is when the furs are prime and everything like that. Mm -hmm. 
beaver is a favorite food and an excellent fur. But once exposed to the air, it must be dried quickly or the fur will freeze. The best drying element, surprisingly, is the snow. To the touch, it feels somewhat like granulated sugar. Nature has given much to the courts. It has also taken much away. Seven years ago, a fierce river current capsized their canoe and claimed a daughter's life. We did have another daughter. We named after the river, Colleen. And she drowned when she was two years old. I just, I, we have a lot of good memories of her out here especially in this cabin, because we were in the process of building it when she drowned. Sometimes it's kind of difficult when you walk around in the woods where what she does and wh where exactly where she did something, and when you there, you just try to have, have good memories of her, but sometimes kind of, excuse me, kind of hard. Despite their loss, the Korths have never thought of leaving. For them, the demands of the bush are more than offset by the joys of being together and in the wilderness. You gonna put her to bed now? Yeah, I have to put her to bed. It's getting kind of late for her. I know, and her sister is sleeping already. Although so medical help is often out of reach, the children have never been seriously ill. But several years ago, Edna suffered a near-fatal gallbladder attack. Bush residents have been known to pull their own teeth, set broken bones, and even amputate their own frostbitten fingers and toes. Record cold possible tonight. Tonight, thick ice fog. Lows 55 below to 65 below. Coldest in outlying areas. Tuesday and Wednesday, thick ice fog persisting. Highs from 35 below to 45 below. Lows 50 below to 65 below. With coldest temperatures again in the outlying areas. After months of isolation, the courts look forward to pilot Roger Dowding's arrival today. He will have to land on the frozen river, but the storm has exposed many obstacles. Cracks, holes, and tree stumps could cost a pilot his life. The courts can't be sure that Dowding will come at all. The plane may have never gotten off the ground. Landing on skis for the first time in, in the snow, uh, uh, I usually try to check the area out. Uh, you're looking for any kind of obstacles. Uh, you're also trying to check snow depth and pack the snow, because once you land, uh, you pretty much have to pack the snow in order to take off. So I, I drag the skis through the snow many times, making tracks, packing the snow, because it's pretty expensive to damage the aircraft out here. And when I feel it's safe, then I'll go ahead and land. Make 
Look at the old runway. Yeah. Jim, I wonder if he's going to land. Look at him. Although bush families choose to be isolated, friends are eagerly welcomed. Children may have seen other people only a few times in their entire lives. People don't just drop by in the bush. Hello, I'm all... Hey, Roger. Roger, Roger? How's Roger and Roger doing? Roger and Roger are doing Pretty fine. Good today. You like a runway? Yep. Pretty good, huh? When are you going to get a straight runway, I'm A straight well, runway? Uh... As soon as the river straightens out. <laughs> You could bring down a tractor so you could straighten it out. Slamming and then taking off around the, around the corner. Roger Dowding comes only once or twice each winter with the mail. Today, he has also brought a special passenger, Roger Waggle, a correspondence teacher who will begin Rhonda's schooling. Yeah, I think so. Where's our mail? I want to get mail done. Your mail? <laughs> patience, patience, Edna, patience. Rhonda, you ready for your schoolwork? OK, come on over and get it. Come on. It's a big, heavy box, but it has your name on it right there. Rhonda's first day of school is more special because Roger and several townspeople have remembered her fifth birthday. Boy, you had a birthday just real soon, didn't you? Not too long ago. Everybody in town sent you a cake, ice cream. We got some ice cream in here. Here we go. Pull it off. Look at there. Look yeah, at Rhonda, there. can I can I trade you this for the cake? No. No? You sure? That's mine. <laughs> That's yours? Please, can I have that? I want a doll. Uh. Come on, Rhonda. Uh -oh. Each flight to the courts cost $1,000 round trip. They could never afford the teacher's visits every four to six weeks. The school district covers the expense. Once Roger Waggle has familiarized Edna with the study program, she will become Rhonda's day-to-day -day teacher. This is our letter book, and it comes from the post office. This type of schooling requires special dedication, but, says Roger, it works. Many of them, if they do their work, it takes two, three hours a day on their part. But if they do their work, they always test up to national norms or even a little bit above. The ones uh, who go to college do very well because they have good study habits. They can adapt to independent learning real easy. Right there, he's our banana thief. And what's he driving? A banana. He's driving a banana. Isn't that kind of crazy, driving a banana to work? Yeah. Look at this street. Tracy. Everybody's running somewhere. Where do you think they're going? There isn't any privacy at all when I travel, which is hard to get used to, but you do get used to it. You eat with everybody else, and you sleep with them, and you talk with them, and you go to the bathroom with everybody else. It's just like living in a very, very tight, small community where uh, you have to get along, because if you don't, you're going to have fights, and you're going to get bushy. And somebody's going to wind up out the door pretty darn cold for a couple of days. All right, a bill! Good. A bill! Hey, now that looks nice. I like that, a bill. The one room, living room, kitchen, and bedrooms all in one, must now accommodate two more bodies. Six people will sleep in a space that would hold little more than a king-sized mattress. 
All the blood goes to my head and I think all night. Well, that's all right. You got a big head anyways. It'll fill up. He's trying to crowd me out over here, too. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? You hey. sleep that way. No, there's no, no. No, no. Waggles, Waggles right there. No, no. no. The floor is you too uneven. Your, you can put your face. You can put your feet in Waggles' your bucket. face. That's my all. Head. It's just Waggle there. It's not, my no. head is going to be next to the stove where it's warm. Okay. Okay. It's, it's too uneven over there. Roger's sleeping right there. It's just right. So, you're going to have I'm going to have to put You put your foot here. You put your foot here. Guys, no, guys are gonna wake you up put your now. feet in, 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 in waggles. Head. My head's gonna be up here by the stove where it's warm. The floor is too uneven over there, so you're gonna have to move your butt. That's all. I'm gonna shut the light off, so you better hurry. No, wait, wait. I gotta no, get my no, back. Here it goes. Here it goes. No, no, it's no, going no. down. I'm not it's ready. going down. I'm, I'm not ready. Shh, Quiet. Down, down, down. Wait, let me get my knife. Down, <laughs> down, down. There. I hope to die out here when I'm old. <laughs> I don't want to be put in the ground in some cemetery with a million other gravestones. No, that's that's how. Bye -bye, it's, I feel I've been taking a lot from this land, and I should, when I'm old and gray and die out here, I I should put back what I took. <laughs> A strong sense of territory distances families here. Many consider entire rivers and mountain ranges to be their own. More than 50 miles away are the Korth's nearest neighbors, the Haydens, a family of seven. The Haydens are old timers in this part of the Alaskan bush. They've been here for two decades. At 15, Susan Hayden already contributes to the family income by trapping. They clear between five and eight thousand dollars a year. Yeah, the best Martin are in like November and December. Yeah. After that. No modern-day Bush family lives entirely off the land. They need cash for supplemental food and some supplies, but they don't need much. That's right. The, after you've been running around in the woods all year with your brand new fur coat, it's going to get a little tough looking. As a young hotel busboy in Minnesota, her father, Richard, read an article on how to live in the woods. He took off for Alaska, determined to find the last place anyone would ever go, just so his space would never be violated. After nine years on his own, he met and married Shannon, a Tlingit Indian. They have five children, aged two to 18. Timberwolf, they've named Lady, is the mother of several of the family's dogs. Rejected by her own pack, Lady often hovers near Susan and her sled team. Susan, like four of the five children, was born at home without medical help. Her father delivered her. Self-reliant beyond her years, she's allowed to go off alone to tend her distant trap line. Hey. 
Susan considers her dogs her best friends. On the trail with my team, she says, I'm never scared or lonely. I run mainly 100 miles a line and check maybe 50 to 100 traps. And I don't trap with a snow machine because snow machines tend to break down too much and require too many parts. Dogs are more fun, they're easier to manage. Lady often follows Susan's ghostly companion. Hey! Like the sled dogs born to the Arctic snow, Susan herself is a child of the wilderness. We mainly trap fur, marten, wolverine. We don't trap wolves, though, of course, but... And sometimes we'll catch a fox or two and sometimes weasels. To complete her 100-mile trek, Susan will be away from home at least overnight. A storm could pin her down for a week. When she's away, her parents worry a bit, but feel she's safer in the woods than in any town. She's been trained in survival skills since she was old enough to walk. I enjoy living out here. I've never, I've been to town a few times and I don't like town life and I don't like the city and stuff. And I like the peace and quiet out here. So and there's much more to do I find out here and it's a joy living in the clean air. In winter, less than two hours of light may be all there is. For the rest, hours of frigid darkness the world seems stilled, but for the piercing echoes of the Arctic night. Sometimes on cold, clear nights, there is a spectacle unmatched in the world. Storms on the sun hurl electrically charged particles into the Earth's atmosphere to create the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights.
For the Browns, as with all Bush families, the rigorous winter routine demands all available hands. Jed splits wood, hauls water, and helps tend the sled dogs. But for Gabriel, winter is still a wonderland. Monotony is one of the biggest pitfalls of life here. By now, the moose Randy shot in the fall has become a real challenge to Karen. One of our favorites is moose quiche. Another one we have is moose enchiladas. Randy's from the Southwest, so he likes Mexican-style dishes, although I doubt they use moose down there. We've had sourdough moose crepes for breakfast. We've had pizzas with whatever meat is around, so that's usually moose. Moose steaks and moose and rice and moose burgers. We'll make moose meatloaf. Uh, we make corn mousse and we make corn mousse tongue sandwiches and corn mousse brisket sandwiches. And uh, we do whatever we can with spices and with other dishes trying to make variety because if you just have moose meat and rice, it gets old after a while, even though it's a great cut of meat. Their isolation has begun to worry the Browns. They agonize about whether it is fair to the children. The cabin is cramped, the boys have no other playmates, and their world is small and limiting. We... But if a decision is made to leave, it will not be made lightly. Then... You have a kid like Jed who's pretty gregarious and pretty challenged. And it's hard for a kid like that to only deal with adults. You know, he deals real well with adults, but it's important for him to have his own peer group. So we're looking at moving on to a larger community, someplace where he can get challenged being a kid, not challenged just being a miniature adult. It was so heavy that we had to carry one piece at a time. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So remote are Bush families that simply going to town is like mounting an expedition. Errol Wilson makes the 160-mile trip only once or twice a year. With his love of things mechanical, Errol prefers snow machine to dog sled. But he takes along old-fashioned snowshoes just in case. See you in a few days. Uh, you be careful. Love you. When Errol is gone, you just worry all the time. It's always in the back of your mind that something might happen and he might not ever come home. Even with all the nice conveniences I have, it's still not. There's just such a, a void here when he's gone. There are a lot of winter dangers out here. Uh, there was a man not too many years ago that lived uh, up on the Candic River, which is about 10 miles from here. And uh, he fell through the ice and froze his feet. And uh, he just couldn't get out after that. He couldn't uh, hunt for any food. So uh, he ended up eating his sled dogs and then eventually when he ran out of food he just died of starvation and uh, they f didn't find him until the next spring after breakup and people could get out again but there are definite definite dangers out here
Errol hits a patch of hidden water, a common but treacherous hazard, sometimes called Alaskan quicksand. There's always open water spots on the Yukon. You can pretty much read the ice and tell when you're in a bad spot and avoid it. Not always. Sometimes it'll appear to be a solid ice, and there'll be snow over it and everything, and you can go right through it. A lot of times, you just have to leave the machine and walk home, or, or let your dogs run loose and leave your sled stuck in it, because it'll start freezing your whatever you're, you've got right into the ice. Surprisingly, clear days in Alaska are often the coldest. The air temperature today could be 50 below. In one of Alaska's more bizarre twists, Errol could freeze to death in full sunshine. Another real hazard is just the, the severe cold. You Sometimes you can't take your fingers out of your mittens for more than 15, 20 seconds before there. If you had to start a fire and your fingers were frozen already, you'd have a real hard time doing it. Of course, naturally, you get your feet wet. And once you get your feet wet, you're faced with having to get out of it real soon and get back to a warm cabin if you think you can make it, or stopping and building a fire, drying out all of your uh, footwear that you have on, and then putting it back on. Otherwise, you'll freeze your feet, and you won't go anywhere. This kind of accident is common in Alaska. Any bush traveler knows that far more than food, the most important emergency supply is a spare set of clothes. Harold is prepared, but closer to home than to town, he decides to abort the trip. Alaska, as a local saying goes, is always changing your plans. After 15 years, the enormous challenges of bush life have not dampened the Wilson spirit, but they are the exception, not the rule. Passable, real passable. <laughs> The way of life out here, it's a vanishing thing. There's not many people around that are carrying on the old lifestyles that used to be here. I think that probably the animals are thriving better than we are. This photo here is, uh, represents a wedding here on the river, Randy and Karen's wedding, and all the people in it were people that used to live out here on the river. We all got together and threw a big wedding party up on a gravel bar up near Nation River. And most of these people now are all gone from the bush. We used to have our own social life back then, and people would get together and share watching children and watch each other's dogs. And now most of these people are gone. Matter of fact, just about all of them. I'm one of the last few people that's left out in this stretch of the river. It's almost like we're the endangered species now. It has been nearly 10 years since Karen and Randy Brown hung pressed wedding flowers in their cabin door. They have cherished their time here, but they have also had children. And they want Gabriel and Jed to know modern life, even if they eventually decide to reject it. The family is moving to Fairbanks. Oh, it's real sad when you think about leaving, when you think about the quality family time that we have here. But when we look at options and alternatives, there's no option that would give our kids the things we want if we go just to a small town on the edge of this wilderness and commute out to here from that. So if we're going to get our kids exposed to quality education, to really having a good peer group, to really seeing cultural diversity and being challenged, we have to go farther. The Browns have made their choice. The others, the Korths, Wilsons, and Haydens, 
plan to stay in the bush, presumably for a lifetime. All in their own way have lived their dream, as few of us have, or ever will. Well, that's it. I guess so. Okay, let's go. Writer naturalist Henry David Thoreau wrote, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived.